So we are uh, concluding today a six-week sermon series that we've been engaged in that's really been exploring our core values as a church here at Trinity. Um, so core values, it's about DNA. It's kind of getting at the heart of those core convictions of what makes us who we are and shapes the way that we, we do ministry. And so each week, we've been exploring one of these core values. And so we have six of them. If we could put them up on the, the screen again. Uh, centered in the gospel, we, this is just by way of review. Remember we said that the gospel really is the core, core value, that everything else flows from um, this good news of what God has done for us in the person and work of Jesus Christ. We've talked about biblical, vibrant worship, that worship is not just about being gathered together, but it's about being sent and living all of life as worship. We've talked about growing in community, that God doesn't intend any of us as disciples to do this alone, but we need community. We've talked about hospitality, and hospitality that goes beyond just being friendly, uh, but it's about making room for others and helping people experience deep connection. And then last Sunday, Pastor Bob explored with us missional engagement, uh, this core value that, that God calls us to join him in mission, uh, locally, regionally, and globally, that we're called to participate in the mission of God in the world. And then today, we're going to explore our last core value, which is openness to change. Here's, here's how we describe it. I want to just read this for you in our kind of paragraph description. Here's what we mean by that. While we are committed to the unchanging gospel, the foundation of all that we do, we as a church want to be open to new methods to communicating that gospel in an ever-changing world. New doesn't always mean better, but doing something because that's the way that it's always been done doesn't cut it for us either. We want to be radically open to where the Holy Spirit is leading us. That last line is especially important. We want to be radically open to where the Holy Spirit is leading us. So when we talk about openness to change, this is not just talking about change for change's sake. We're talking about being open to the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. And when we're open to where the Spirit wants to move and wants to move us, um, then, then invariably what that will mean is that we will be changed, right? I mean, that's, that's part of the gospel, that we'll be transformed, that we're going to grow more and more into the image of Jesus. And not only will we be changed, but if we're open to the Holy Spirit's presence and power, then we're going to be called to join God in bringing change uh, to those around us. One of the things that I appreciate most about Trinity is that this has been part of our DNA from the beginning. <laughs> you know, we're celebrating this year our 100th uh, birthday and, and from the beginning, I mean, Trinity was planted because it started because it wanted to take a fresh approach to um, not just uh, preaching and teaching uh, the scriptures in Dutch, but to, but to have um, English offered as well. And that was a big change, right, 100 years ago. And think about, for those of you who've kind of been around, think about all the other different changes that have happened over the years. Um, I find that this congregation is one that doesn't get stuck in you know, kind of saying, wait, well, you know, wait a minute, we've, we've never done it that way, or this is how we do it here. Uh, my experience in the last couple of years of getting to be with you has been that this is a congregation overall that tends to be very open to trying new things, to stepping out and seeing where God leads, and to experimenting um, all for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of others. And while all of that is true, change is hard. Right? Change is hard. Even when it's good change, it's hard because change always brings with it a sense of loss. Even when it's, even when it's a positive kind of change. And what we, what we resist is not necessarily change, but we resist the loss that comes with change. I mean, think about that for your own life. What have been some, maybe some good or natural changes that have happened? You know, maybe going to school, starting a new job, getting married, having kids, becoming empty nesters, retirement. I mean, the list could go on. Maybe those are, those are kind of natural life changes, and yet there's often a sense of loss that comes with that. And that can be true with the church as well. I want to explore this morning then um, what it would look like or what it might look like for us personally and together to continue to be open to change, even, even when it's hard, to trust that God is leading us. And, um, and, and that really, again, is a call to be open to the work 
and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And here's how I want to get at that. So we've been spending time in Romans, and we've seen that, I mean, the church in Rome uh, was a church that was experiencing all kinds of changes, right? As they sought to be open to the work of the Holy Spirit among them. One of the biggest changes that we've talked about over the last few weeks was that for the first time, Jews and Gentiles were being brought together as the one family of God. And that was a really, really hard change, a, a good change, but it was one that was so different from the way that they had related with one another before. In fact, these were groups that had stayed separate, and often there was hostility between them, and yet here they are now becoming one family in Christ. I want to share with you the story this morning about how that happened, that Jews and Gentiles now became one together. And we're going to go to the book of Acts to hear that. Um, I want to just invite you to listen to this story this morning because I think this is one of the most powerful stories about being open to the presence and power of the Holy Spirit and being open to change that you'll find in the New Testament. I'm going to be reciting this from the NRSV. And again, if, if you could just not follow along, I want you to instead just, I want you to be present to the story as I offer it to you today. And I want you to consider how do we, you know, where, where are we in this story together? Where might we find ourselves in this story? Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you that you are a God who is faithful and unchanging, even as you call us each and together to continue to grow and change, and even as you call us to be courageous as we seek out or step out to um, embody the gospel in a changing world. So this morning, as we hear your word today, uh, Lord, may this story come alive for us in such a way that we find ourselves in it. Jesus, that you would meet with us, that you would do your work in us. And may it all be for your glory. It's in the name of Jesus we pray and all God's people said, amen. So hear the word of the Lord from, from the book of Acts, chapter 10. In Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius. He was a centurion, part of the Italian cohort, as it was called. Now, he was a devout man. He feared God with his entire household. He gave generously alms to the people, and he prayed constantly to God. One day, at about three o'clock in the afternoon, he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of the Lord coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, he was terrified. He answered, what is it, Lord? The angel said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now, send men to Joppa in search for a certain Simon called Peter. He is staying with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who had spoken to him left, Cornelius called two servants and one of his loyal soldiers who had been under his charge. And after telling them everything, he sent them to Joppa. At noon the next day, while they were on their journey and as they approached the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry, and while he was preparing food, he fell into a trance. And he had a vision in which he saw the heavens being opened, and, and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground, by all four of its corners. And in that sheet, he saw something like a whole array of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. And then he heard a voice saying to him, Peter, get up, kill, and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that was profane or unclean. The voice said again a second time, Peter, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. And then 
the sheet was taken back up into heaven. Now, while Peter was greatly puzzled by this vision and what it might mean, suddenly the men sent by Cornelius appeared. They asked for Simon's house, and they were standing by the gate, and they called out and they asked if Simon called Peter was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about this vision, the Spirit of God came to him and said, Look, those three men, they're searching for you. Get up and go down to them and go with them without hesitation, for I have sent them. So Peter got up. And he went down to them, and he said to them, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? They said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and devout man who is spoken well of by the entire Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house so he could hear all that you have to say. So Peter invited them in, and he gave them lodging. Now, the next day, he got up, and he went with them, and some Jewish believers accompanied Peter. The following day, they arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them, and in his home, he had gathered some relatives and close friends. And on Peter's arrival, he went out to meet him, and he fell down at his feet, and he started to worship him. And Peter made him get up and said, Stand up, I'm only a mortal. And then, while they were talking, Peter went with Cornelius into his house. And he found all the people assembled there. And he said to them, You yourselves know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or to visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I must call no one profane or unclean. So when you sent for me, I came without objection. Now, may I ask you, why have you called me here? Cornelius said to him, four days ago, at a, about this hour, a man in dazzling clothes stood before me and said that my prayers and my alms had been remembered by God. And then he told me to send men to Joppa to search for a certain Simon called Peter who was staying with Simon the Tanner in a house by the sea. So immediately I, I sent for you and you have been so kind to come. And now here all of us are in the presence of God and we are ready to listen to everything that the Lord has commanded you to say. And so Peter started to preach. He said to them, now I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who calls upon his name, who is upright and fears him is acceptable to God. For you yourselves know the message that he gave his people Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God had anointed this Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went around doing all kinds of good works, and he healed those who were oppressed by the devil because God was with him. And now, we are witnesses of all that he did both in Jerusalem and in Judea. But they put him to death. They hung him on a tree. But God raised him from the dead on the third day. And he allowed him to appear, not to everyone, but to those of us whom he called to be witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he was raised from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify about him that God ordained him to be the one who was the judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him so that everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness in the power of his name. And while Peter was still preaching, the Holy Spirit fell upon everyone 
who heard the word. And the circumcised believers who had come with Peter from Joppa were astounded that even the gift of the Holy Spirit was now given to the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And so Peter asked, who, who can withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded that they be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. After that, they invited Peter to stay with them for several days. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Such a powerful story, isn't it? Did you know that Acts chapter 10 is the, it's the longest chapter in the entire book of Acts? I mean, that's like 50 verses. And it's such an important story. It's a turning point because up till this point, we've seen the gospel moving first in Jerusalem and then out in Judea. But now, it's like the gospel breaks open and, 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 and we realize that this gospel is not just for the Jews, not just for the, 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 the Jewish community, but this is a gospel for all people, even the Gentiles, now have been welcomed into the family of God because of who Jesus is and what he's done on our behalf. This is really a story about change. Who gets changed in this story? I mean, typically it's thought to be the story of Cornelius's conversion. Uh, Cornelius, this, this, this Gentile centurion, so think about that. Not only was he a Gentile, but he was also part, he was a commander in the Roman Empire who were the imp oppressors, the Roman army, so he was an enemy. Cornelius, who becomes a follower of Jesus, not just Cornelius, but his entire household, but this, this is not just a story about Cornelius's transformation. Who is it really about, do you think? What would you say? This is where I need your interaction. <laughs> Who's the other character in the story? Peter. Peter. And the Jewish believers. It's just as much about their change as it is about Cornelius. I want to offer just a few observations in closing here uh, as we think then about what it means for us to be open to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Uh, to being changed and to be agents of change in the power of that spirit. Just want to point out a handful of things that strike me about this story, and maybe you noticed them too when you heard me share it with you. But, but here's the first. If, if we're going to be open to the presence and power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, um, it really is a call for us to be a people who are devoted to prayer. Did you notice that about both Cornelius and Peter, that they were characterized as being men of prayer? Cornelius, who is described as, as constantly praying to God. Peter, who when he has this vision is up on the roof praying. What we know, I mean, we're, we're told in Acts chapter 2 that one of the marks of discipleship of the early church is that they devoted themselves to prayer. If we're going to be open to the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, it, it calls us to a posture of, being, uh, of, of, of prayer, of being attentive to God, paying attention, of, of, of listening deeply to what God is saying to us. Prayer is the tuning fork that tunes our hearts and our minds to the will of God. Can I ask you, what role is prayer playing in your life right now? Can you be uh, described as a person whose life is characterized by this posture of prayer? What about for us as a church? What role is prayer playing in our life together? Here's the second thing that I would point out. If we're going to be open to the presence of the Holy Spirit and open to change, they devoted themselves to prayer, listening to God. But the second thing that we see for both of them, Cornelius and, um, and Peter were each given a vision. God spoke to them, was directing them, but they, they didn't have clarity. They couldn't get clarity on that vision alone, right? They only came to understand what God was doing together. They needed one another. Cornelius needed Peter to preach the gospel to him. And Peter needed Cornelius to be, uh, to be the gospel, to see, I mean, to see, I mean, it's, it's, it's only after Peter arrives in Cornelius' household and sees the power of the gospel at work and the spirit falling upon the Gentiles that he says, now I truly understand 
God had given him a vision. The Spirit had directed him, but, but it's only in relationship with Cornelius that he's able to say, now I get it. I get it now. Discernment always happens in community. This has probably been true in your own life as you sought God's direction. I mean, how, how, how often has it been that God has put somebody in your life to help you get clarity in terms of where God is leading you or what God's calling you to do? I think about for us as a church. I mean, I, I shared this earlier in the update with the unfolding, but it's been amazing to me in this process of how together we've been able to discern the Holy Spirit leading us one step at, the way, uh, uh, one step at a time. Discernment happens in community. We can only know who God is calling us to be and what he's calling us to do in community. Here's the third thing that strikes me about this story. This is my favorite part of the story, actually. Is that both Cornelius and Peter had to make the decision to obey, to act in faith, even when they didn't fully understand what God was doing. Wouldn't it be great if when God called us to something, especially something big or hard, that he would kind of set us down and say, let me just share with you the full plan. Here are the details. Let me give you the map. You know, this is exactly how this is going to go because I don't want you to feel uncomfortable at any point. Um, and yet that's, that's I, I don't know if God ever works that way. If he does, it's rare. What I love about the story that you just heard is that so Cornelius is visited by the angel, told to send for this guy named Simon called Peter. He has no idea who is this guy, what does God have in mind. Somehow this, this, this guy has a message for him. He didn't understand, God didn't say, and Cornelius, this is how this is gonna work, and he's gonna come, and he's gonna do this, and this is what's gonna happen. No, in that moment when the Spirit prompted him and called him to do something, Cornelius acted in faith. And Peter does the same thing. My favorite line is when Luke tells us, uh, I love this line, while Peter was still greatly puzzled by the vision, <laughs> then the men from Cornelius appeared. I so often feel greatly puzzled when God calls us to do things. Typically, God doesn't give us the complete picture first and then call us to act in faith. But usually God calls us to act in faith, and as we act, he begins to give us clarity in terms of what he's doing. Is God calling you to step out? Has the Spirit of God prompted you to do something, to go somewhere? And for you right now, it doesn't fully make sense. You're not sure exactly where this is going to lead, but what you know is God is calling you to do it. So the question is, will you act in faith? Will you step out and obey? Will we do that as a church? Here's the last thing. Is that both of them, Cornelius and Peter, demonstrate humility that leads to surrender. There was a spirit of humility, of being able to say, there's so much I don't know and don't understand. And here's maybe how I thought God acted, and here's how I thought things were supposed to be, and yet I have the humility to say, but God is teaching me something new. God is showing me something new. And it's a kind of surrender that's being willing to, to, to let go of comfort, to let go of fear, to let go of our need to be in control, which I don't know about you, but for me, that's often the hardest thing and to step into this new thing that God is doing. You know, Peter didn't need to say yes. Cornelius didn't have to say yes. When God called them into this, they could have said no. They could have. God still would have acted. God would have done what God wants to do with or without them. They could have said no, and yet it strikes me that they didn't. When the opportunity came, when the moment arrived, in the Spirit's strength, they found the courage to say yes. And think about what they would have missed if they would have said no. I mean, as uncomfortable as this was, as hard as it was, think about what they would have missed if they would have said no. They would have missed out on being part of something so much bigger than themselves. 
They would have missed out on the change that God wanted to do in their own life. They would have missed out on being part of this mission of the gospel reaching people that were beyond their wildest imagination. I came across a story a couple weeks ago, and I'm going to leave you with this today. Uh, in a devotional that we're doing as a family um, called He Walks Among Us by Richard and Renee Stearns. And Richard Stearns is the CEO of World Vision. And in this devotional, um, actually his wife Renee is writing this one, and she's, and she's talking about how they were in Malawi and came to this impoverished village in Malawi. And, and when the vehicle pulled up, suddenly a swarm of kids um, rushed towards them and they had been playing soccer, and one of the little boys was holding a soccer ball. Well, kind of a soccer ball, because what it really was is that it was a bunch of plastic bags that were rolled into a ball, and they were tied with rope. And Renee said to the little boy, um, she said, hey, she said, can we make a trade? Will you give me your soccer ball, and I'll give you a new one? She wanted to take it back to the States to be able to show just how incredibly creative and resourceful these children were uh, in these impoverished places. And so this little boy just kind of stared at her, puzzled and hesitant, and decided that he needed to go talk to his buddies before he made a decision. So he ran back to his buddies, and all these boys are talking, and, they're, and then suddenly with a smile, he comes running back, and he holds out the soccer ball, and he gives it to her. And she pulls out of her bag, a brand new soccer ball and hands it to the boy and he takes it with a big smile on his face and he takes it to his buddies and as she was reflecting on that exchange here's what she writes think about your own life right now as God's calling you to step into something new she said it must have been difficult for that little boy to imagine a ball that would be better than the one that he had made with his own hands that ball was familiar he was comfortable with it, and it was really hard for him to give it up. As beautiful and sturdy as the new ball might be, that old one still had an allure that he couldn't quite shake. A lot of people feel about their lives the same way that this boy felt about this ball, especially when they sense that God is calling them into something new. They like what's familiar, what's comfortable, and they're reluctant to leave it behind, even if they are reasonably certain that to do so would be to follow God's leading. Hanging on to something that might be good, they miss what's even better. Can I say that last line again? Hanging on to something that might be good, that might be comfortable, that might be familiar, what if by hanging on to that we miss what's even better? Here's my question. What are you hanging on to that's keeping you from stepping into the even better that God has for you? What's holding you back? Where the Spirit leads, even if you don't fully understand, will you go? Will you follow? Lord, we want to just sit with that question this morning. And I want to just give a minute here for us to get present to what you're saying to us today. God, I believe that you're speaking to some of us directly to our hearts about a decision we've got to make in our own lives right now. Lord, about a way in which you're calling us as a church. Lord, we're listening with humility. We surrender.
Lord, help us to get into action, to not just be hearers of the word today, but may we find the strength and the courage and the power of the Spirit to act, to go, to step, one step, one step, where you lead, we'll follow. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Hey, I want to give you a challenge before we have the benediction this morning. So one of the big things that God is calling us to step into, you've heard us talk about it, is this enfolding with hospers. And we're looking for, um, we're looking for people who want to be on mission with God to invest in six months of being a part of this congregation and this new thing that God is doing. Um, so I'm asking you, and maybe you individually, I mean, college students too, maybe your family, would you consider... Uh, from January to July to go and be on mission with God in hospice. Uh, would you consider that? Would you just pray about that? Be open to hearing from the Spirit about that? Um, if you'd like to explore more about what that could mean, again, don't forget about this, this gathering that will happen right after the worship service today. Uh, but we're excited. We're excited. I, I'm still greatly puzzled <laughs> um, and wanting to keep stepping in to where God's leading. We're never more alive, I believe this, we are never more alive than when we're at the center of God's will. Would you stand for the benediction this morning? Let us go from this place then with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, with the love of God the Father, and with the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace to serve the Lord.